Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Thank you, Justin Zellers. Thank you, Pepper Geezy. Thank you, Carmine Bailey. And welcome our new patrons, John and Diatech. Um. On this episode of DTNS, how to keep AI from ruining the climate, plus... Google's AI responses are awful, but we'll tell you why not to worry. And smart rings get competitive. There's no longer one to rule them all. <laughs> this is the Daily Tech News for Friday, May 24th, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm Allison Sheridan of the Podfeed Podcast. Drawing the top tech stories in Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. There is no better way in podcasting to finish your week than to spend it with the Daily Tech News Show, folks. That's why we're here to help you understand stuff. Let's start with the quick hits. Apple confirmed to 9to5Mac that the mysteriously reappearing photos on some iOS devices were not coming from iCloud. But in case you didn't believe Apple, security researchers at Synactive reverse engineered the problem and confirmed the photos were coming from inside your phone. Whoa. A migration routine was mistakenly re-indexing the photos and then adding them back to your gallery if you were affected. A Reddit user suggests that people might be saving or had saved photos to files and photos, but then only deleted them from photos. Mm. In fact, I actually checked this and I am one of these people who has uh, oh. photos in places that I uh, was not aware. Interesting. Um, yeah. That would be how the rogue migration routine could end up finding them again. Yeah, it would find them in files and then be like, oh, these need to be restored because it was all messing up. That makes a lot of sense. Scientists at the University of Washington uh, demonstrated some research about how they can isolate voices of people so you hear only that person and nothing else in the room. No other people, no other noises, etc. The software just needs... Regular old headphones and some microphones, and then you look at the person that you want to hear, tap a button, and that person has to be speaking, and then the machine learning algorithm trains on that speaker's vocal patterns in less than five seconds. Uh, in fact, one uh, of these outlets tested it and got it in milliseconds to isolate that voice from the rest of the noise. Then you only hear that person's voice. The longer they speak, the better it gets at isolating them because it's continually training. System can only do one speaker at a time, though, and that speaker initially has to be away from any other loudspeakers so that it's clear which voice you're training on. Think about this for future uh, uh, hearing aids. This is going to yeah. be amazing. No, that's really, that was one of the first things I thought of too. Spotify's Car Thing product is a dongle to stream Spotify music over a car's sound system. It sold for $90 between February and July of 2022. Some head scratching at first when the product came out. Thursday, Spotify started notifying users that the device will stop working this coming December 9th. The company gave instructions to reset the device to factory settings, responsibly dispose of it, but did not offer a refund for the currently still perfectly functional device. Ah, come on. Send, send them a, like a Bluetooth adapter, if nothing else. <laughs> I know. Jeez, yeah. Spotify. Uh, well, here's some sad news. Uh, you may know Dogecoin began as a joke cryptocurrency, but has persisted because of enthusiasm behind it, because it's pretty funny. It is also well known, of course, for its adorable Shiba Inu dog used in its logo. That dog, Kabosu, was four years old when it became the face of Dogecoin. Sadly, Kabosu passed away from leukemia and liver disease on May 24th. Kabosu lived with a teacher named Sato Atsuko in Sakura, east of Tokyo. Sato posted a picture of Kabosu with her paws crossed on a blog in 2010. That became a meme on Reddit, which eventually inspired Dogecoin. Crypto organization Own the Doge crowdfunded a statue of Kabosu, which has been installed in a park in Sakura as of last November, and has worked with Sato to raise more than a million dollars for charities like Save the Children in the name of Kabosu. Foxconn will begin uh, making Google Pixel photos in the state of Tamil Nadu in India. Foxconn has two plants in Tamil Nadu. It assembles iPhones in one of those facilities near the city of Chennai. Ah, getting more assembly going on in India. 
All right, headlines blaring today about Google's AI overview. That's the summary answer that Gemini gives you at the top of your search results. Headlines use a lot of examples like telling people to use glue to stick cheese to your pizza or Gemini telling you to refill your blinker fluid, something that doesn't exist. Uh, geologists recommending that you eat one rock a day, according to Gemini. Uh, list goes on and sometimes gets worse. Google says, quote, the examples we've seen are generally very uncommon queries and are not representative of most people's experience. But smart people sometimes want to believe them anyway. Oh, come on, Tom. Blinker fluid are eye drops. Use that, you know? <laughs> right, so, right. You know, How did you I gotta forget have that? fluid if you want to yeah. blink. Um, yeah, besides the sort of like, obviously, glue making pizza is really bad advice. We know the stuff isn't always accurate, but we don't also think that people will believe the kind of funny dancers, right? Turns out uh, humans are a little like Mulder when it comes to AI. They, they want to believe. Uh, a separate study that came out from scientists at Purdue University showed that 52% of chat GPT's answers to questions about programming on Stack Overflow contained errors. But 35% of the time, a group of 12 programmers preferred that incorrect answer anyway. Why? The study said, quote, polite language articulated and textbook style answers and comprehensiveness are some of the main reasons that made chat GPT answers look more convincing. So the participants lowered their guard and overlooked some misinformation in chat GPT answers. So, Allison, uh, there are bad answers on Stack Overflow from humans all the time. So do you think it's the the manner of the bad information being presented that's the difference here? Well, actually, on Stack Overflow, it's a voting system. So if you find a question that matches what your question is, and there's one answer that has like 103 upvotes and five others that each have three upvotes, you know which one the right answer is simply by looking at the number of votes or by the credibility of that person or whether they've been corrected. So you have a lot more information. The other thing is if you go directly to ChatGPT, uh, uh, you can see when you get the answer back from ChatGPT, it shows you where the sources were. So it'll say, here's a button to click Stack Overflow to go right to Stack Overflow and see it in context. So you have a lot more context in order to figure out what the right answer is, not just here's three answers, which one's right. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, so the, going back to just the 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 focus of information being presented as correct when it is not, you know, how do we get around that? Yeah, consider that there are billions of answers being gem generated by Gemini in AI overview now that everyone has access to it, and you're talking about hundreds of incorrect responses that lead to it looking like there's a lot, right? Because hundreds is a lot, but it's a very low percentage. It's like 0.0001% of the incorrect answers. And Kyle Orland at Ars Technica did a great breakdown of what categories of misinformation Gemini is doing. Uh, it is treating jokes as facts. So whether it's from The Onion or just a sarcastic comment on Reddit, it doesn't know that those are sarcastic, and so it treats them as facts and passes along glue for your pizza. Bad sourcing. Sometimes non-joke, reputable sources just get stuff wrong. But LLMs don't cross-check other sources like a journalist should, and sometimes Gemini uses alternate reality or fandom sites that it doesn't know aren't meant to be taken seriously. Uh, another category is answering a different question. Does a dog play in the National Hockey League? Well, one Gemini answer was yes, because there's a mascot in game adjacent activities. It can't do math well. LLM predicts language, and it gets pretty good at predicting math because of that, but it's not 100%. And then there's the same names problem, where it can't tell one Sarah Lane, the ballet dancer, from the superior Sarah Lane who hosts this show. Right, right. Yeah. Mm. Google SEO. Uh, yeah. <laughs> my, uh, my grievances go way back, but yes. Um, okay. So there are, there are some limitations here and companies obviously are aware of this and want to minimize the limitations, but what do we think we should do? Yeah. We should keep in mind the results need a critical eye. They are often right, but not always right. 
Uh, you could also turn it off. Google doesn't give you a setting to turn it off, but The Verge had an article today that that shows you how to do it. You can actually save a search with some Google switches that'll turn it on, off, or you could just use the new web filter right next to images and news in Google search. You can say, just give me links. Don't give me anything else, and that'll get rid of AI overview as well. Allison, I uh, haven't uh, played around with some of these tools. What is your strategy going forward? Well, one of the things that gets back to this critical thinking thing is Google refers to these funny examples about geologists telling us we should eat rocks, that these are obscure questions and they're ridiculous. And of course, everybody knows those are wrong, but it's, it's worse when it's subtly wrong. You know, mm -hmm. where, where it's got, it's close and it's really well written. I've read some stuff where I'm like, wow, that sounds really, wait a minute, that's not right. But it's only because I go and I cross-reference. I cross-reference everything now. Um, and even when it's just something happy, like there's a cool picture of a whale, a video of a whale eating krill off the coast of San Diego. And I immediately checked with some of my friends who were real into this kind of stuff and said, is this one real? I just doubt more. Um, and, and my preference is for dedicated AI that where, where you can get to a tailored answer for just that one kind of thing that you're trying to get the answer to. And that seems maybe a little bit better. Yeah. AI overview, I treat as a like, oh, that might be the answer. Let me check. Like th that's mm -hmm. pointing me down the direction that I should look, basically. Indeed. Yeah. I mean, I still feel that about Wikipedia, <laughs> even though I know, you know, most stuff I read on Wikipedia has been sourced and resourced and moderated, but I'm still like, hmm, interesting. Let's, yeah. let's, let's see where that article came from and, and find out more about it. Absolutely. That's a hundred percent. We need to teach practice. us critical thinking like that, Sarah. Oh boy, uh, you know, <laughs> of my existence with like 75% of my friends, although they're wonderful people otherwise. And some of, of those wonderful people um, are very interested in uh, smart devices that they wear on their bodies. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I wear an Apple watch. I used to wear a uh, Versa 2, which is uh, in the Fitbit ecosystem. It's a Fitbit uh, branded uh, watch. Loved that one. Um, I, I'm into watches. Not everybody is, or they want something that is just an alternative, um, um, you know, look, feel, everything. Smart rings. They're a thing. Uh, you might know about the Aura smart ring that's been around for a while. And you hear about the Aura is like, oh, yeah, that's the, if you want to wear a ring that is a smart device um, that can track you know, all sorts of things, you know, your sleep and your activities and your steps and everything, it would be the Aura. Not, not the only one, though. There are options. For example, the Amazfit Helio Ring sells for $300. That's the same price as Aura's base model. Um, so that's, uh, you know, again, just a smart ring you may not have heard about that's about the same price. Now, the Aura Ring starts at $300, goes up to about $550, depending on the model. If you're going to get the, the rose gold finish, you're going to pay a lot more. But... Um, they're pretty comparable um, in what they do and how they do it, except that the Helio ring was developed by Zep Health, which has been around since 2015, doing a lot of smart device stuff, smart watches, et cetera. You can sync to the Zep smartphone app and also to Amazfit's watches, handling sleep tracking, fitness tracking, like the Aura does, though reviews vary as far as accuracy, you know, with all of these devices. ZDNet thinks that uh, Helio's big advantage is being able to integrate its data with a smartwatch, something that Aura doesn't do yet. But it's an example that the smart ring space is growing. Not everybody wants to wear a ring, but the, for those who do, uh, you got options. And Allison, you had you had mentioned before the show that it was sort of like, well, but the Aura ring could connect to Apple Health. So if you yeah, have an I'm not iPhone, you know, is it really all that different? Yeah, I'm not sure what that really buys you to be able to be connected to the watch, because if your watch is showing your health stuff and your health app is getting the data from the Aura Ring, then I'm not sure whether there's a big advantage. And I, I, Yeah, maybe. I've always thought them as... For the ZDNet author, there thing. was, right? Everybody's got different pain points. And, and, and so, yeah, I'm not sure that the Helio Ring blows the Aura out of the water because it can integrate with the Amazfit watch. But if you have an but Amazfit watch already... Maybe they're, the Helio they're is a better one choice to for you. One, right? As yeah. far as their look, their feel, what I believe that they can do, especially for that base price. Although I do, you know, I've, I've got some uh, folks who uh, I, I talk about fitness trackers with people all the time just because why not? And I've got friends who just are like, you know, I just don't want to wear a watch. Apple Watch sounds great, um, you know, or, or other, uh, you know, armband stuff. Great. It's just not for me. Maybe I have another watch that I just prefer, you know, or, you know, I wear jewelry on my wrist or I don't want anything. 
And there's another product called the Whoop, <laughs> W-H-O-O-P, Whoop. And uh, I had not heard of it until probably about a year ago. A friend of mine who's, he's trying to, um, he's trying to really lean into fitness, lose some weight and lots of other stuff. Um, and so he's just tracking all sorts of things. And he says, it's great because I could wear it on my wrist. Or maybe if I was like, I don't know, I had to go to a meeting. I just didn't want it to be sort of like something that is what the first person sees. I could like hide it up on my bicep. I could wear it on my ankle. Um, it is, uh, you know, I could like, like put it on like a belt loop if I'm, you know, um, playing basketball. And I was like, huh? Yeah. So like none of these scenarios really apply to me. Cause I like my Apple watch. Like I would wear this to a wedding. No problem. <laughs> like, like, I don't care. Like, I think it's cool fashion, but just goes to show you that, uh, the alternative to smart watches are increasingly an option. I think whoop is interesting because, um, it is subscription only. You cannot get the hardware unless you get a subscription. And mm. of course, the longer you get a subscription for, which is, I think, 24 months, comes out to about $200 uh, per year. Not cheap. You really have to want this data and, and have it mean something to you. You know, back on Amazfit for the watches, I'd never heard of this company before. These are some cool options. I mean, they got things that look exactly like an Apple Watch, but lots of really elegant looking watches, super sporty kind of watches. They've got uh, stuff with a ton of complications. They're really cool looking. They had a lot of options. Yeah. And I, I could see where you're going to use the watch during the day, but maybe you don't want to wear it at night because that's me. I don't want to sleep with a watch on. It's just not my thing, but I'll, I'll sleep with a ring on. I do it every night, right? Uh, I got my wedding ring right here. So if I popped another ring on the other finger and that could track my sleep, then yeah, I'm, I'm into that. Uh, Aura has been not the only one in town. There have been other smart rings out there, but it's kind of the only one that that's gotten attention. And I feel like the Helio ring, because it's in the Amazfit family, is getting some attention to people who already like the Amazfit stuff. And they're like, hey, I'm already yeah. in that Zep ecosystem. You know, let me get that. And it does signal to me that this is becoming a viable category, right? It wasn't just a one-off with the Aura getting attention from the NBA, which it did. It's it's something that that is going to become competitive and we'll have choices, which becomes interesting. Okay, when do we get the Samsung Galaxy Ring uh, take off? When does Apple get into this, if it ever does? You know, that's sort of the next steps here. I think there's also, there's a weird barrier to entry with a lot of wearables. Like for example, you don't want to wear your watch overnight. Neither does my mom, even though she loves her Apple watch and is very faithful to it during the day. I don't care. I don't even, it doesn't bother me wearing it at night. Um, you know, I even sometimes forget and like take a shower with it and I'm like, yeah, it's fine. It's, you know, Waterproof. water resistant. Um, but, uh, but, uh, but, I, uh, Heather Frank, who is my co-host on have such a good day. Um, she recently got an aura ring and she said, you know, she, you know, it was delivered. She put it on her finger and was just like, Nope, cannot deal with this. Mm -hmm. I just, I, I don't know why, I, why I bought this. This is just not for me. And she was like, within about 48 hours, it was fine. She it was just it was totally there. fine. Yeah. And now mm. I never take it off and I love it so much. Uh-huh. You know, yeah. and and not that that's what's going to be everybody's experience, but take I it think off a lot charge, of this stuff though. is just like it's new, it's different. <laughs> ah, I'm wearing this thing. Yeah, yeah, that's kind yeah. of true of all jewelry at first, right? So you you have to yeah. have a little breaking in period. I just can't decide if I want to go with a uh, you like it, you should put a ring on it or big whoop pun to finish the story. So <laughs> whoop, whoop. I'll leave that to the audience to decide. Yeah, that's a good idea, Tom. Thanks. Hey, uh, did you hear about top five? Uh, it's short now, only 60 seconds, but it has all the same amount of info. We have a compression algorithm that Roger perfected to put the best of top five into a short version. This week, things people fear about AI. What you fear about AI, I will tell you. You will face your fears if you watch this short. Go catch it at Daily Tech News Show on TikTok, DTNS Picks, DTNS PIX on Instagram, and YouTube.com slash Daily Tech News Show. Hey, Ava. Thank you for sending us an email. Ava asked us if we could address the ecological impact of AI going forward. Uh, I responded to this actually in my freetechnewsletter.com issue on Thursday, but Allison was excited to talk about it more today, so we're gonna. Uh, here's the summary of the article that I talked about yesterday. MIT Technology Review's Casey Crownhart wrote, 
AI is an energy hog. This is what it means for climate change. And I definitely recommend reading that article. Here are a few of the highlights. Electricity from all data centers. That includes cloud computers, crypto, and of course AI. But all of it together made up 2% of electricity demand in 2022. That is expected to double by 2026. So 2-4% of electricity demand by 2026. The total demand for data centers, again, all data centers, not just AI, probably could reach between 160 and 590 terawatt hours by 2026. As a comparison, total worldwide electricity demand from all uses by people is expected to increase to 3,500 terawatt hours by 2026. Electric vehicles and industry growth are expected to be larger sources of demand than all data centers and therefore than AI. Crownheart notes a study in 1999 that warned that personal computer use would eat up half of U.S. electricity demand by 2009. It didn't because computers got more power efficient and there were other reasons as well. But we were able to avoid that apocalypse. Uh, it's not the rise in demand that's important. It's what you do about it. How do you meet that demand that matters? So back in March, Microsoft announced a plan to use warm water uh, from cooling a data center in Denmark to help heat up uh, up to 6,000 nearby homes. Now, Allison, you visited Iceland, not Denmark, but, you know, <laughs> up in a, a northern area of the world, learned a lot about geothermal there. And uh, what Opera is doing is interesting, right? Yeah. So, Steve and I went to the geothermal energy exhibition in Orfus. That's the only thing I could pronounce the name of the exhibition. I can't pronounce. I'm not going to say it. Uh, but while we were up in Iceland, and it's probably not escaped your attention that Iceland has uh, volcanoes. You might have seen some of that in the news recently. And they use the naturally occurring underground heat to power the country. So to address the problem of increased energy uses for AI, the browser company Opera is working with a company called At North, and they specialize in specialized Nordic data centers to build, uh, and they are going to build a data center in Iceland for Opera to use the geothermal energy there. So I thought that was, uh, that was pretty cool that they're looking at if the energy usage is something that we need, it is only bad for the climate if you use the wrong kind of energy to, to uh, support this. So putting this uh, uh, data center up in Iceland, that's genius. That's the right way to do it. Yeah, there's the the real takeaway that I had from this article is yes, if we put all the data centers and hook them up to new uh, carbon emitting <laughs> power sources, <laughs> that is going to cause a problem. That's a bigger problem for industry and electric vehicles. So whatever we do for data centers, we need to do for other things too, or we're only treating a smaller part of the problem, not the bigger part of the problem. Uh, and then there's also uh, an article you read, Allison, about you know some of the things that you could do. Yeah, so uh, Brian Calvert at Vox had an interview with Sasha Lucioni. Uh, she's the lead climate researcher at an AI company called Hugging Face. You just got to love that, the name of the company. Anyway, she pointed out that data centers today tend to be built where you have non-renewable energy sources because they're more consistently reliable. You turn it on, you've got energy because you've got the power plants there. And um, she emphasized that we need to give people choices. And she wants to work on something akin to like an energy star rating for AR, AI models and AI services. For And one of the reasons she was looking into that is because specialized AI tools are vastly more energy efficient at their assigned task than a genera generalized AI model would be at that same task. So that's kind of why she was going along this, let's have an energy star rating. Well, Allison, what 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 do you think going forward, knowing what what you know now from from your travels and further research that you would like to do? Well, I do like her idea of an energy star rating for AI tools, and I think that could help. But it depends so much on people sacrificing something they want to do to save the planet. And people aren't real good at that selfless sort of thing. If they want something, they want it. And I don't have much control about how other people run their data centers, so I can only work in my own little world. We put in solar, we've got whole home batteries, we drive EVs. The only next thing I can really do to affect this generalized problem is to vote for people who will push for investments in green energy solutions to keep up with what appears to be a voracious demand for more energy.
Yeah, and I, and I think putting pressure on companies uh, to say, hey, you know what? Uh, I, I would like you to have your data centers hooked up to a non-carbon emitting source of energy. Uh, however that is achieved, uh, that is very important to me. I think will cause companies to, to change. We've seen companies make pledges to do that sort of thing in the past. Microsoft has a zero emissions goal by 2029. And interestingly, its problem is not the rise of AI use. Its problem is building the data centers to meet the rise of not only AI use, but Azure uh, use. And it's the emissions from the construction, from the steel and the concrete that are threatening their ability to meet that carbon uh, em emitting uh, goal, not the use of AI. So I, I feel like it's really important to pay attention to, hey, yeah, uh, just not using AI might make you feel good. It may not do that much. You should not. You should be using AI. If there's an Energy Star rating, you should say, "Hey, I'm going to try to use the one that emits the least carbon." And then you should let companies know, you know, I I want to use your product, but I want you to be powering it responsibly. How do you How do you put pressure on a company though? All, As a all kinds of ways, human. right? You can you can talk about it uh, publicly. You can talk about it with your friends. You can write to them uh, by email. Like we have so many more ways of expressing our opinions to companies than we've ever had before. Uh, I feel like there's more examples in the past 20 years of a company being pressured into not doing something because of public pressure than there is of regulation because regulation moves so slowly and a bunch of people posting on X or, or, or anywhere, Facebook or whatever, uh, causes companies to do about faces more, more, I don't know, expediently. <laughs> yeah. Sonos has been under a lot of pressure just recently about how they screwed up accessibility with their latest app and the humans rose up and, and, uh, hollered at them and they've, uh, they've been making some real progress in the last couple of weeks. They're not there yet, yeah. but they have made big changes. So yeah, it's a really good example. I mean, if Apple will change the silly ad that crushed things because people are angry, like <laughs> they that's didn't not even take that it important. Down, Tom. They didn't take it down the last They said I they weren't going to run it though, right? And they, yeah. so so they had a reaction to True. to the public pressure, you know. Yeah. And that's Good point. that's not even a super important one in my, at least in my opinion. All right, let's check out what's going on in the mailbag. <laughs> Scott wrote in about Microsoft's new recall feature that are rubbing some folks the wrong way uh, because we keep getting feedback from you all and thank you for that by the way. Scott says, "I agree." It sounds private, but Tom asked the question of how they could make it more private. Two words, opt in. Lots of talk about how to turn it off so it would be on by default. Most people just would never. Also, Microsoft's track record with privacy and following users' wishes is abysmal. Scott says they often reset changes, change them even if you specifically set them. I also at this point have no faith that there's anything they've said about on-device data and not sending to them is true. Scott has a last point, and he says, I don't have references handy for the discussions, but if anybody gets into your account, they'll have access. All bets are off with a compromised device. But Microsoft isn't doing well with security lately either. This is another opportunity to make Microsoft's features into the end user's problem. I, I, I disagree on a lot of this stuff, but uh, I have to admit, Scott is not alone. Uh, a lot of people just said, you know, I don't care. I don't trust Microsoft to do it right. I don't trust them not to change their mind. Uh, I, I just don't trust Microsoft. And 28-year-old uh, Tom Merritt very much agrees with you. Go check out <laughs> some brilliant news. Uh, Milton wrote in, uh, there's a whole new generation of AI models being developed that require all the horsepower of a dedicated neural processing unit, the, the NPU, the one that offloads a bunch of the AI processing to run locally on your PC. It just can't be done on a GPU, writes Milton. Or if it can, you then you can no longer use the GPU for graphics. Roger wondered why you can't have an NPU add-in card for desktop PCs, and maybe you can, but laptops are outselling desktops by about three to one, and Microsoft decided to go after the bigger market. Nobody today would ask you why you have a GPU when you can just have the processor for graphics. It's going to be the same with NPUs, and AI models run locally on your PC. That's a great point, Milton. It is very similar to the integrated GPU not being as powerful as, as the discrete GPU. So, Tom, I wonder whether you can do uh, a Thunderbolt card for an NPU, so that's essentially like being on the bus in a desktop PC. Yeah, I... I imagine there's probably some loss of efficiency whenever you don't have it tied in the way that uh, Microsoft yeah, is tying yeah. it in. But I don't know how much of a loss if it makes any difference. So, yeah, I don't know why you couldn't. Better than nothing. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know who's so much better than nothing that it's insulting <laughs> for me to even bring up that comparison is Len Peralta. Len, what have you been drawing for us today? So a couple of years ago, my uh, we were on vacation and my son uh, was the jokester he is was made a comment that possums can swallow a man in one bite. And someone overheard that and said, I don't think that's true. And that is sort of like gender, like the uh, AI overview, Google's <laughs> AI overview, where you're making statements and you're hoping that somebody hears them and it's just sort of weird. Anyway, this is uh, my take on that. Uh, here are some things, obviously, that uh, Google's AI overview had said, said <laughs> such as non-toxic glue can help cheese stick to pizza. Uh, uh, the U.S. has had one vampire president. Really? Um, are we sure it's not true? <laughs> Donkey teeth, and right. today not, is my son's. <laughs> today is my son's twelfth birthday. Oh wait, that's true. Happy birthday, Julian! Yes, he turns twelve today. Oh, so happy true. birthday, Julian! Happy birthday, Julian. Hey. Uh, this image is actually at my online store at lenperaltastore.com, or you can go to Patreon, patreon.com uh, slash len, where you can get it uh, at at the DTNS lover level. By the way. Uh, I have have a couple things open, commissions open. If you're looking for something for Father's Day, graduations, uh, hit me up. I'd be happy to uh, to draw something yeah. for you. Especially if your father's graduating. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Hit two and one your right father's there. Father is graduating. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah. You better, better you better come to Len at that point. That's true. Uh, Allison Sheridan, also a pleasure to have you on the show. Let folks know what your latest is. Well, I just celebrated 19 years of the Nocella cast coming out every Yay. single week without missing an episode. Yay. <laughs> that that is that's a run. That is a run. Uh, without Tom missing say, an episode, I, I can't even claim that. I've missed tons of episodes. So well, yeah, people, well done, Alice. I've had stand-ins. The show has not missed an episode. Um, Tom would say I've started my twentieth year. So the That's most right. recent episode of the NoSilicast number 993 includes a really interesting segment with Pat Dangler, Steve Sheridan, and me talking about how Pat's Tesla wall charger failed, how she diagnosed it, and then how Tesla actually gave her great support. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of a stranger than truth story. You don't hear those kind of things anymore. Anyway, check it out at podfeed.com or you can find the NoSilicast in your podcatcher of choice. Programming note, this coming Monday, the U.S. Memorial Holiday is happening. I think it's a bank holiday in the U.K. as well. Uh, but there will not be a DTNS episode. However, if you're a patron, you will get an episode of Live With It, where Sarah talks to Rob Dunwood about his Elgato teleprompter. If you've been thinking about a teleprompter for your own YouTube or TikTok channel or anything else, maybe for a church broadcast, you don't want to miss this. Patrons, also, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. It's Friday, and we're going to trash talk. Our trivia quiz is all about e-waste, and we're going to see who can waste the other with their knowledge. Maybe it's you. Stick around. <laughs> you can catch our show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern at 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. As Tom mentioned, we're off this Monday for the U.S. Memorial Day holiday, but we're back on Tuesday with Charlotte Henry joining us. Talk to you then. Have a great one. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and co-host, Rob Dunwood. Video producer, Joe Kuntz. Producer at large, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Dutterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottis One, BioCow, Captain Kipper, Steve Gautarama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Tom McNeil. Contributors for this week's shows include Chris Ashley, Scott Johnson, Chris Christensen, and Allison Sheridan. And our guest this week was Andrew Main. And thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>